This lecture is about the approach to syncope with a focus on what is useful for the emergency physician. Syncope accounts for 3% of A&E visits and up to 6% of hospital admissions in the United States. As many as 40% of people below the age of 40 have experienced syncope, and 20% of people have had at least one episode of syncope by the end of adolescence. The causes of syncope range from benign to immediately life-threatening. However, many hospital admissions for syncope are not warranted. A system of evidence-based risk certification may serve to reduce unwarranted hospital admissions. In this presentation, I will be touching on common causes of syncope, important points to look out for in the history and physical examination which are the most useful for determining what causes the syncope, and I will explain some methods of risk certification that are currently in use. True syncope is an abrupt loss of consciousness with spontaneous return to normal function without any medical intervention. It is associated with loss of postural tone. It may be due to any condition which temporarily decreases oxygen or nutrient supply to the brain, such as by depriving the brain of its blood supply, or which interferes with normal brain function. Many conditions that may be confused with syncope do not really fit this definition of total reversibility. These include near syncope with no true loss of consciousness, drop attacks, strokes, intoxication, migraines which may sometimes present bizarrely, altered mental state, and even sleep. Seizures may sometimes be confused with syncope and should be excluded with a good history. Hypoglycemia and metabolic imbalances, as well as other conditions such as strokes or subarachnoid hemorrhages, may present as syncope. But in these conditions, normal function does not usually return completely without medical intervention. A good history and physical examination is of paramount importance, both to distinguish true syncope from conditions that mimic it, as well as to elucidate the cause of the syncope. In fact, the 2007 review of syncope by the American College of Emergency Physicians, or ASAP, List history, physical examination, and the 12-lead electrocardiogram as their only level A recommendations for risk stratification. Further investigations for syncope should always be directed by the history and physical examination. Always remember that syncope is a symptom of an underlying condition, but not a diagnosis in itself. At the A&E level, we try to look for a clear cause for syncope, although this may not always be possible to find in the A&E consultation. Our first aim is to quickly rule out life-threatening and serious cases of syncope. This is a long list which includes conditions such as potentially lethal arrhythmias, blood loss due to gastrointestinal bleeding, ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, ectopic pregnancy, and ovarian cyst rupture. Dangerous conditions such as aortic dissections, pulmonary embolisms, and subarachnoid hemorrhage can all present with syncope as the initial complaint although these are usually associated with other signs and symptoms as well. In most life-threatening causes of syncope, the cause will become apparent on history and examination. If there is no clear cause for syncope at the A&E, however, we will have to make the decision whether to admit or discharge a patient based on whether they are high or low risk for morbidity and mortality. We should not miss syncope in cases which may not have presented or been triaged as syncope, but which have presented as road traffic accidents, or patients who have sustained head injuries, fractures, or lacerations in falls. Keep the possibility of syncope in the back of your mind for patients who present with trauma, especially for the elderly who may not mention syncope in their history. Syncope is responsible for up to 15% of falls in geriatric subjects, and this is significant because falls account for up to 12% of deaths in ger the geriatric population. Here is a quick overview of the many different things that can cause syncope. These include cardiac disease, neurological conditions, hypotension, which is especially dangerous in acute blood loss, hypoglycemia, medications, reflex mediated, which includes vasovagal, psychiatric disease, and unknown causes. History taking is of paramount importance in arriving at the underlying cause of a syncopal episode. It can sometimes be difficult to get a good history if there is no eyewitness. It may help to use the sample template for history taking. S stands for subjective complaints and symptoms. Ask the patient what they can remember of the episode, which may help to determine if it was true syncope. Was there complete loss of consciousness? The patient may remember falling to the ground, in which case 
he or she may not have completely lost consciousness. And a uh, syncope should not be confused with seizure, stroke, or head trauma. Were there any associated symptoms which may give clues to the etiology of the syncope? Ask the patient if they had any abdominal pain, tenderness, or rectal bleed, for example, which may point to a gastrointestinal hemorrhage. If the patient has neurological deficits before or after the episode, such as uh, focal neurological deficits, dysarthria, diplopia, and blood vision, for example, it may point to a neurological condition such as stroke. However, syncope is associated with complete spontaneous return to normal function, so this is not considered to be true syncope. M for medication is important because many medications are implicated in syncope, especially drugs which have vasodilatory effects. Commonly used drugs which are implicated in syncope include antianginals, nitrates, and antihypertensives. They predispose to autostatic hypotension by reducing blood pressure and may produce a syncopal episode. Other drugs include beta blockers, antiarrhythmics, and digoxin, which can affect cardiac output. Drugs of abuse such as alcohol and cocaine may also produce syncope by altering sensorium. In addition, tricyclic antidepressants, phenothiazines, quinidine, and imodarone may predispose to arrhythmias by prolonging the QT interval, and this can also cause syncope. Besides lowering blood pressure, diuretics may alter serum electrolytes and cause syncope as well. And other medications implicated include anti-Parkinsonian agents and Alzheimer's medications. Ask the patient about their past medical history, as comorbidities may sometimes be very significant, especially cardiac disease. Coronary artery disease is associated with poor left ventricular function and heart failure, which carry a poor prognosis for syncope. The patient may have structural obstruction to left ventricular outflow, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and aortic stenosis, which does present commonly with syncope or angina. Sometimes the patient may have a syndrome of sudden death such as Brugada syndrome, long QT syndrome, and sometimes there may be Wolf Parkinson White, which is another rare condition which can lead to tacky dysrhythmias causing syncope. A family history of sudden death is also significant, especially if it is associated with family history of deafness which can point to one of the long QT syndromes, javel lang nielsen syndrome. The L in the sample history often stands for last meal, but in women of childbearing age, it should also remind us to ask for the last menstrual period, as this is very significant. Pregnant women may experience syncope, and they sometimes they may also have ectopic pregnancy or immediately life-threatening condition. It is important to ask in detail regarding events that occurred before, during, and after the episode of syncope. What was the patient doing when syncope occurred? Was he standing, seated, supine? Had he just got up or was he exercising? A patient who experiences syncope while exercising or supine may have a structural cardiac defect. Sometimes syncope experience in response to sudden emotion may point to long QT syndrome. If a prodrome was present uh, when the patient was aware of the sensation of going to faint, if he had sweating or nausea before the episode, this may point to a vasovagal syncope. However, if the patient had no awareness that he was about to faint, this may point to more dangerous causes, especially a cardiac dysrhythmia. Eyewitness accounts of the episode are useful for determining the duration of loss of consciousness, presence of any seizure activity, and presence of post-ictal confusion. In trying to distinguish whether an episode was a syncope versus a seizure, it is useful to see whether there was a history of unconsciousness lasting for more than 5 minutes or a post-ictal period as evidenced by confusion lasting more than 5 minutes, which tends to point towards a seizure episode. 
Other points in the history which point to seizure include disorientation or an aura prior to the episode, abnormal posturing during the episode, lateral tongue biting, or serious injuries sustained during the episode. However, points such as urinary incontinence and clonic movements do not help to distinguish between syncope and seizure as they can occur in either one. Points that are more suggestive of syncope include the awareness that one is about to faint, sweating or nausea prior to the episode, a quick return to consciousness and a lack of tongue biting. However, despite a good history, 40% of all cases of syncope may still end up with no established diagnosis despite further evaluation. Start the physical examination by looking at the vital signs of the patient. And normal vital signs such as tachycardia and hypotension are signs of hemodynamic instability. Consider blood loss, volume depletion, heart failure, and sepsis. Take the patient's pulse to feel for any presence of an irregular heartbeat. Check whether there is a postural blood pressure drop. The definition of orthostatic hypotension is of a systolic blood pressure drop of more than 20 mm mercury, which differs between blood pressure taken when the patient is supine and a subsequent blood pressure measurement repeated when the patient has been standing for more than 3 minutes. However, this is not sensitive as a postural blood pressure drop is found to be present in 40% of asymptomatic patients over the age of 70, and it is also present in 23% of asymptomatic patients who are less than 60 years old. Even if there is a postural blood pressure drop, this may not necessarily be the cause of the patient's syncope. Note the conscious level of the patient. Patients with true syncope should have returned to their normal baseline mental state. If they are still persistently disoriented or have an altered mental state, consider a neurological, toxic or metabolic cause which is not true syncope. Do a complete cardiovascular examination looking specifically for signs of heart failure or heart murmurs, especially new heart murmurs. Signs of heart failure would include lung crepitations, raised jugular venous pressure, distended neck veins, pitting edema of the peripheries, and possibly hepatomegaly. An abdominal examination should be routine. The presence of a pulsatile abdominal mass may point to a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. Abdominal tenderness may suggest the presence of a perforated abdominal viscous. Do a complete neurological examination, comprising examination of the cranial nerves, motor and sensory function of the limbs, reflexes, and cerebellar signs. The findings may tie in with cardiovascular findings of atrial fibrillation or carotid breeze. An altered mental state, as mentioned, may suggest an underlying metabolic or pharmacologic etiology. A patient who already does have poor cognition in the baseline mental state may have been at higher risk of making a medication error while taking their medication. Also examine the patient for signs of trauma which may have been sustained in a fall. <clears throat> the patient may have head trauma or signs of tongue biting. We should also ask ourselves if trauma preceded the syncope or followed the syncope. As mentioned earlier in the overview of causes of syncope, there are many different causes of syncope. I have arranged them from the most dangerous to the least. We will start with cardiac disease, which is a very dangerous cause of syncope. It may cause syncope via dysrhythmias or outflow obstruction due to structural heart disease. The dysrhythmias comprise both tachycardic as well as bradycardic dysrhythmias. Potentially lethal tachycardias include ventricular tachycardia and torsades that points. Other tachycardias that can cause syncope through reducing cardiac output are supraventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, and flutter. The bradycardias include second and third degree heart block and sinus node disease. Sometimes syncope may be related to pacemaker failure, which occurs, for example, if the pacemaker has run out of battery or sustained a mechanical malfunction such as lead fracture. <laughs> 
Patients who are known to have a history of coronary artery disease, poor left ventricular function and or heart failure have been found to have a very poor prognosis following an episode of syncope. The long QT syndrome and Brugada syndrome deserve to be mentioned as rare causes of potentially lethal arrhythmias. Both of them may produce ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. The long QT syndrome may be either congenital or acquired. Congenital long QT syndromes include the Javel and lang nielsen syndrome, which is autosomal recessive and associated with deafness, and the romano watt syndrome, which is autosomal dominant and not associated with deafness. Acquired long QT syndrome may result from the use of certain medications, including the antiarrhythmics and um, as well as amiodarone and other medications which will be touched on in the following slides. Patients with long QT syndrome tend to experience symptoms precipitated by emotion, stress and exercise. It is easy to screen for long QT syndrome by a quick glance at the ECG. If the QT interval takes up more than half of the RR interval, it is long QT. Brugada syndrome affects mainly Southeast Asian men. ECG findings are not always constant. The ECG changes include a uh, right bundle branch block, which may be incomplete, and ST segment elevation in the precordial leads, which uh, may or may not have an elevated J point. This also carries a differential diagnosis of a myocardial infarction. Brugada syndrome is thought to account for up to 4 to 12 percent of all cases of unexplained cardiac death. Another inherited syndrome, which can cause syncope, is Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, which results from a bypass tract between the atrial and ventricles, allowing for rapid conduction. Patients are at risk for atrial flutter or fibrillation with a fast rate, which can produce syncope through reducing cardiac output. The patient may feel palpitations, chest discomfort, or lightheadedness prior to the syncope. Aside from the dysrhythmias, Syncope is sometimes produced by structural heart disease which causes an outflow obstruction. This results, for example, in cases of myocardial infarction, ischemia or myocarditis which leads to an acute pump failure. Or it may be caused by valvular disease such as aortic or mitral stenosis or acute valve dysfunction that is a mechanical complication of a myocardial infarction. Aortic stenosis may present with syncope alone it does not always present with angina and congestive heart failure, which are the common presentations. Other causes of outflow obstruction are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary embolism, atrial myxoma, which is rare, as well as acute prosthetic valve dysfunction. Sometimes impairment of venous return, as occurs in a pericardial tamponade, may also impair the outflow tract. Red flags in the history taking would include syncope that occurs on exertion, a history of cardiac disease, a family history of sudden death, and associated chest pain and palpitations with the syncope. Another vascular cause of syncope is aortic dissection. The term Stokes Adams attacks is used to describe the clinical appearance of cardiogenic syncope due to heart blocks or arrhythmias. Typically, the patient is pale during the attack and flushed during recovery, with a loss of consciousness of seconds rather than minutes. It is a term that is still used by non-cardiologists, but not often used in uh, the circles of cardiology. Neurological causes of syncope rarely present as a true syncope, as often they are associated with lasting neurological deficits. However, they should still be considered as they are potentially life-threatening. One of the conditions is subarachnoid hemorrhage, which may present with loss of consciousness preceded by a severe headache, which may be the worst in a patient's life. It may also be followed by neurological deficits, but not always. Vertebral basilar insufficiency can occur as a result of an acute occlusion, such as occurs in a stroke, or it may be the result of a phenomenon like the subclavian steel syndrome, where the arm is supplied by retrograde flow of blood from the vertebral artery. Usually, this is associated with lasting deficits such as diplopia, vertigo, and nausea, which is 
able to differentiate it easily from other causes of syncope. The presence of peripheral neuropathies in a patient, especially patients who have diabetes mellitus, may suggest coexisting autonomic neuropathy which can produce syncope due to autostatic hypotension. Hypotension may be caused by a number of causes including acute blood loss, dehydration, sepsis, or the use of medications such as diuretics. In the case of acute blood loss, the cause is usually obvious. The patient may have hypovolemia as the result of a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, ectopic pregnancy, ovarian cyst, or may have been the victim of a motor vehicle accident and a multiple trauma patient who may have a ruptured spleen. These patients require immediate intervention. Metabolic causes of syncope are rarely spontaneously reversible without medical intervention. These include hypoglycemia, hypoxemia, and electrolyte imbalance such as hyponatremia. As previously mentioned, the medication history of a patient is important, as this may have been the cause of the patient's syncope. Groups of medications include nitrates and antianginals, vasodilators, antihypertensives of all kinds, and it also includes drugs that can cause a prolonged QT such as antiarrhythmics, amiodarone, and clarithromycin, as well as some other antibiotics. Sometimes a patient may not provide a history of use of tricyclic antidepressants or drugs of abuse like cocaine or alcohol, and this may have to be specifically elicited in the history. A large number of people suffer syncope due to reflex-mediated cause, um, and these causes include vasovagal syncope, syncope as a result of carotid sinus hypersensitivity, which can sometimes be triggered off by shaving or by wearing a shirt with a tight collar, or situational syncope as occurs in micturition, postprandial, and tussive syncope. Consider that a patient may have syncope due to autonomic failure uh, due to Parkinson's disease, or secondary to diabetes, uremia, or spinal injury. Certain medications may have blocked the autostatic reflexes of the patient, such as vasodilators and antidepressants, or the patient may have volume depletion. Psychiatric disease is sometimes associated with syncope, but this is a diagnosis of exclusion. Psychiatric conditions which may present with syncope include depression, somatization disorder, panic disorder, and substance abuse. For up to 50% of cases of syncope may sometimes never be diagnosed with an underlying cause. Syncope of unknown cause is very common. The most useful investigation for syncope at the level of A&E is the electrocardiogram. This is able to provide information about whether the patient has an acute coronary syndrome or arrhythmias and can sometimes pick out certain conditions like hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or pulmonary embolism. The hypocount is useful to detect hypoglycemia which is easily reversible. A urine pregnancy test is uh, useful in all women of childbearing age as both ladies with intrauterine pregnancy as well as ectopic pregnancy may present with syncope. A routine CT brain is not recommended. It should be done only if patient is suspected to have a neurological pathology. Likewise, full blood count, urea electrolytes and creatinine, cardiac enzymes and chest x-ray should not be done routinely but only as guided by history and physical examination. The cardiac enzymes would be useful if the patient has signs and symptoms of ischemia, and the chest x-ray is helpful in certain cases such as aortic dissection, heart failure, or suspected chest infection. Other investigations such as electroencephalograms, echocardiography, are not routinely performed unless guided by specific findings in the history and physical examination, and often these are not available at the A&E. There have been many guidelines for risk stratification developed to identify patients at risk of adverse events. The San Francisco syncope cohort is just one of them. There are five components to this stratification system, which can be remembered by the acronym CHESS. Firstly, there is a history of congestive heart failure. Secondly, hematocrit of less than 
Thirdly, an abnormal ECG. Fourthly, complaint of shortness of breath. And lastly, systolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters mercury. A patient with any one of the above was considered at high risk for a serious outcome as defined by death myocardial infarction, arrhythmia, pulmonary embolism, stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage, need for transfusion or repeat A and E visit within 30 days. This rule had a 89% sensitivity and 52% specificity for death at one year. Regardless of the study done on which scoring of risk stratification to use, the common denominator of almost all studies showed that the most significant risk factors included an abnormal ECG, which could be defined as an ECG that showed ischemia or a non-sinus rhythm, a history of congestive heart failure or structural heart disease, and the presence of shortness of breath. OH is also an independent risk factor for adverse outcome as the elderly are more likely to have syncope of all etiologies. They are prone to multiple etiologies of syncope and they tend to have coronary artery or myocardial disease and higher tendency for autonomic dysfunction and the use of polypharmacy. Usually the cause of syncope is very difficult to establish for an elderly patient at the A&E. There is no one cut-off age to define what makes a person at risk due to age, but generally a patient who is less than 45 years old with no history of heart disease or other risk factors is considered to be low risk. Other risk factors that have sometimes been quoted to predict adverse outcomes include a history of obstructive pulmonary disease and also a lack of prodromal symptoms before the syncope. When deciding the disposition of patients with syncope from the A&E, it is useful to employ risk stratification systems. Generally, it's easier to decide if a patient is high or low risk. High-risk patients may benefit from an ICU admission. These include patients with dysrhythmias, pacemaker-related syncope, ONG problems such as ectopic pregnancies or ruptured ovarian cysts, gastrointestinal bleeds, pulmonary embolism, heat stroke, and other life-threatening causes. All patients who have suspected cardiogenic syncope should be admitted for evaluation of underlying heart disease or the detection of dysrhythmias which may not be obvious in the A&E setting. These patients should have continuous ECG monitoring both in and beyond the A&E. Low-risk patients are patients whose syncope is reflex-mediated, psychogenic causes, medication-related who are completely symptom-free, or patients who had autocytic hypotension but are currently free of symptoms. Patients who have unknown causes of syncope but are otherwise well, fairly young, less than 45 years old, and have no persistent symptoms, also can be considered for discharge. A cardiology referral may sometimes be indicated for these patients, and all these patients should be appropriately warned to return in case of recurrence of symptoms and to seek medical attention if they feel unwell. They should also be advised that if syncope recurs while driving or swimming and playing other sports, they may potentially be dangerous for them. Patients who are at moderate risk may benefit from admission either to the ward or to a short-stay ward. These are patients who are more than 60 years old, who have a history of congenital heart disease, valvular disease, or left ventricular outflow obstruction, a history of coronary artery disease in the absence of chest pain or ischemia, or a family history of unexpected sudden death, but who do not have any other symptoms remaining. Sometimes exertional syncope in younger patients without an obvious benign etiology may warrant further inpatient work up. In summary, syncope is a symptom and not a diagnosis. There are many possible causes of syncope. In the A&E setting, our role is to rule out the most dangerous and life-threatening causes. Both common and rare causes of life-threatening syncope must be considered. Multiple causes of syncope may coexist in a single patient. So even if one cause has been found, we should not overlook other potential causes. A good history, physical examination, and ECG are the most useful for risk certification in the A&E.
all patients at high risk for morbidity and mortality should be admitted. This includes all patients suspected to have cardiogenic syncope who should be placed on continuous ECG monitoring. For low-risk patients who are planned for discharge, the appropriate discharge advice and follow-up should be given. Outpatient investigations which may sometimes be done for low-risk patients include halter monitoring, event monitoring or implantable loop recorder, depending on the frequency of their symptoms. In addition, severely incapacitating recurrent reflex-mediated syncope despite being of a benign etiology may sometimes be considered for a cardiac pacemaker if the patient fails medical treatment repeatedly. In addition, young patients without underlying heart disease and frequent syncopal events may be considered for a psychiatric referral as appropriate.